airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person, trying to find out more about them and confirm, or not, their suspicions. Airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. 
And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. And placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours notice for such an order, or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, Pilots used the National Weather Service's two-letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you could easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors, you, the airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. 
It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears, for example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles, it's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence. And while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilot for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. 
Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and therefore aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use, but since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners, they won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one, don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports. And carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. 
If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There is a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time, but the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. 
First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt. And forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the US, then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. You're on an expedition through the swamplands of Florida. You run into some sinkholes. Oops, was that a crocodile? Watch out! Suddenly, you reach an asphalt road. It looks a lot like a runway, but there's no airport building around. You decide to inspect it, and a walk down the runway takes you a half an hour. At the end of it, you notice a trailer. There are four people inside. They tell you you've accidentally run into what was supposed to become the largest airport in the world, five times the size of JFK, to be more precise. Project Everglades Jetport was launched in 1968 right at the end of the golden age of air travel. It was supposed to become an intercontinental hub with six runways for supersonic jets carrying up to 300 passengers. They chose this location between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, far from large cities, because it would make it possible to fly both to South America and Europe in under three hours. At that time, the top speed for a commercial passenger plane was around 500 miles per hour. But that was about to change. Concorde was almost ready to make its first flight, and Boeing was also working on a huge lightning-fast passenger plane. So those super short flight times would be perfectly possible. And no one would mind the loud sounds of takeoff and landing over the ocean, unlike in the area around some inland airports. Passengers would travel to the new hub by high-speed rail, connecting it to surrounding cities on both the Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. The terminal was supposed to be extremely luxurious, with many lounges for its future well-off passengers. But none of this ever came true. The construction of the airport began, but was finished right after they built the runway. First of all, residents and activists saw a report saying that the new airport would ruin the South Florida ecosystem and the Everglades National Park. So they were strongly against the construction. Second. The Boeing supersonic passenger jet program was called off. In less than 20 years, while the tests for supersonic planes were running, the Federal Aviation Administration received 40,000 complaints about sonic booms from people living under the testing areas. Those sounds of shockwaves created by jets traveling faster than the speed of sound were breaking glass and scaring people and farm animals. So the airlines across the country knew supersonic flights wouldn't be a commercial success, and there was no more need for a huge airport to serve those planes. The finished runway was used for training pilots for years. It's long enough to land Boeing 747s and is in an isolated location, so it was perfect for those purposes. Then, as flight simulators became way more advanced and pilots didn't need to practice there anymore, the unfinished airport started serving general aviation aircraft. Even on its busiest days, it doesn't get more than a dozen takeoffs and landings a day. So the staff of four people works here from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. every day. Sometimes they use the airport for car races. On the other side of the world, what used to be an airport of prime importance is now a ground for picnics, festivals, and fashion shows. You can also go skateboarding and fly some kites on the runways of the former Tempelhof Airport in Berlin, Germany. It was the world's largest building until the Pentagon was finished. It was also the first airport in the world to have an underground railway. The site of the airport belonged to the Knights Templar in medieval times, and that's how it got its name. The 1920s were its prime time. Closer to the end of its service, mostly small commuter aircraft used the airport until it was shut down in 2008. Floyd Bennett Field in New York is now also living its new life as a ground for cycle races and stargazing with the Amateur Astronomers Association. It used to be New York's first municipal airport in the 1930s. 
American aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart used to land here. Then, Newark Airport in New Jersey was growing in importance more and more, and Floyd Bennett Field was closed for good. One of the most beautiful stations of the New York subway with vaulted ceilings, arches, and emerald green tiling is sitting underground, abandoned. The very first subway line had the City Hall station as its southern terminal stop. Over 15,000 people were excited to take a ride when the subway was officially opened at the very beginning of the 20th century. The ride back then cost one nickel. The very first ride departed from that crown of the jewel City Hall station. Over the years, the subway trains became longer and they could no longer stop and let passengers board safely because of the curved platforms. And that's how the station started losing its passengers. People got used to the subway to the point that they didn't care about its beauty, but mostly functionality. Plus, the City Hall station has always been off the express track, so passengers prefer to use the nearby Brooklyn Bridge station instead, which lets them travel much faster and also get off closer to the famous bridge. So the only way to visit the City Hall station today is to take part in a tour organized by the New York Transit Museum. No trains at all depart from the great abandoned train yard in Bolivia for at least 80 years. You'll find over 100 train cars not far from Uni. It used to be an important transportation hub for the region for a long time because of its good location between major cities in Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. The hub played an important role in transporting minerals to the Pacific ports. By the middle of the 20th century, the mines had been exhausted of resources and shut down. The trains were left to rust in the salt flats. The beautiful steel trains turned into ruins in no time because of the salt winds that corroded the metal. Now the yard is a popular tourist destination. If you ever find yourself in Turkey, you might run into a Disney-style village standing empty and not finished. It cost the company in charge of the project around $200 million to build over 500 castles, around 200 fewer than they originally planned. The village of Burj al-Babas, surrounded by a magical forest, was supposed to have leisure centers, Turkish baths, some luxurious shops, and other entertainment for its inhabitants from all around the world. The people were happy to invest money in the future royal-like life, but then an economic crash hit the country. The buyers were worried about the future of the project and pulled out most of the funds. The construction company went bankrupt and the fairy tale village stands abandoned ever since. In the middle of the 20th century, a man in the Turkish region of Cappadocia was renovating his house and then noticed that his chickens had started to disappear for good. He decided to solve the mystery, so he did some digging and found a dark passage going underground. It turned out to be one of 600 entrances other homeowners found leading to a whole abandoned underground city. It was large enough to fit around 20,000 people and had a complicated system of 18 levels. Archaeologists found that it wasn't just a bunch of tunnels in the dark, but had all the signs of civilization. There were schools, kitchens, dry food storage, cattle stables, and many dwellings down there. There was even a complex ventilation system and a protected well to provide air to breathe and fresh water for everyone. The city was first mentioned in writing in 370 BCE. It was most likely built as a shelter from natural disasters and enemies. Cappadocia was the perfect place to build a place like this because there's no water in the soil and the rocks are easily moldable. What's up? Feeling anxious while landing? Hey, there's no need to worry, even if you land in such a particular place as Bhutan. Thing is, the terrain here is so extreme, it makes it super complicated to land. What's interesting about flying there is that there are really few pilots out there who are certified to land in Bhutan. Yeah, zigzagging toward the ground sounds like a real quest. Bhutan Paro International Airport is often named one of the world's most dangerous airports. In the whole world, there are only two airlines that fly to this airport. About 10 years ago, there were only 8 pilots who were permitted to fly there, but today the number is a bit bigger. But even so, there's something even tougher than Bhutan Paro International Airport. Seems like the Tenzing Hillary Airport in Lukla, Nepal has every possible danger. 
short runway, super powerful winds, mountainous terrain, this place has it all! <laughs> the runway here is only 1,729 feet long. Just for comparison, a regular runway in most airports is about 10,000 feet long or even more. Now, many airports have carpets in their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks – low ceilings, comfortable seats, and a pleasant natural lighting. Needless to say that all those decorations cost airports a pretty penny. And carpets are not as easy to clean as hard floors are. But the key thing here is that they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them feel more relaxed. Well, sorry to break it to you, but it's not only meant to make you feel good. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports are likely to increase their own income. Hey, as for spending money in the airport, there's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in – the golden hour. It's the time when passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Ah, let's admit it. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashing sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. You know how it sometimes goes? You get to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. Bye-bye, water bottle. Actually, you have an opportunity to mail them to any address inside the country. As for the unclaimed baggage, it's usually stored for about 60 days. Things taken away by security and not claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the screening passengers by observation technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior to detect suspicious people. Uh -oh. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they will talk to the person to try to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main terminals and passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? They then check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest clues in people's behavior. So, you arrive at the airport already anticipating a couple of weeks away from work and all your daily troubles, park your car in the lot, and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? Well, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody has to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab or have a friend drop you off. Contrails, those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes, are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets may turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. 
Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the plane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew outside will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time to rescue the passengers and the flight crew. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. Woohoo! There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. They move in strange ways, but have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut fuel costs and make air travel even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air collide at very high speeds and it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes over mountain ranges and near jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, so it exits from the tail. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than to go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the plane on the outside. Anyway, if you're still nervous about flying, remember what pilots say. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. Uh, that didn't help, did it? A lot of airports are built near water, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. First off, most airports are located in big cities, and big cities are usually built near some form of water anyway. Back in the day, before trucks and proper roads were built, goods were transported by ship. Having a river or ocean nearby was vital to deliver essential supplies to the cities, like food and building supplies. It also allowed for trading to boost the local economies. Because most people travel into big cities for business and holidays, rather than rural areas, it made sense to build the airports there. The high demand for travel meant that the airports were needed and also made them profitable. But that's not the only reason they're built near water. Big cities are usually super crowded, and airports require a lot of land. Imagine trying to find a space big enough in the middle of New York City to put an airport. It would be basically impossible. Areas next to water are usually a bit more rural, so there's more space than the big cities filled with skyscrapers. Some countries have even taken this one step further. Land is really scarce in Japan, so to build Kansai International Airport, the architects of Osaka headed three miles offshore to Osaka Bay to make a man-made island. The artificial island is 13,200 feet long and 8,500 feet wide. That's so big that it can even be seen from space. It took a whopping 38 months to complete, and travelers can get across to the main island of Honshu via car, railroad, or high-speed ferry. Kansai International Airport opened in 1994 and became the world's first airport to be built on the sea. Despite its location, it has the longest airport terminal in the world with a length of just under one mile. Airplanes also can't have any obstacles around them when landing. It would be really difficult to try landing a plane with obstructions. These include trees, mountains, buildings, and power lines. Over water, nothing will restrict planes from taking off or landing making it much safer. On mountainous islands, runways are often parallel to the ocean, as the mountains are inland, just like in the Grand Canaria Airport located on one of the Canary Islands. It also links to safety reasons. 
If a plane has to cancel a runway landing and go back around again, there must be enough room for it to do this safely without hitting anything. It's also got to be able to climb back up into the air at a safe angle to avoid causing problems for the passengers inside. Reaching this safe altitude is much easier, quicker, and safer by the sea compared to big cities or mountainous areas. Speaking of failed landings, pilots are trained to deal with engine failure on takeoff. If a plane reaches the right speed for takeoff, it has to leave the runway, even if the engine fails. But don't worry, planes can still fly with only one engine, it just requires a bit more effort. Because of the reduced capacity, it takes longer to reach the right altitude, and more space is required for takeoff. Taking off towards the ocean makes it easier to climb to a safe altitude without worrying about colliding with any obstacles. Another reason for airports being built at water level is that the higher up we go, the thinner the air becomes. It causes the thrust of the engines to decrease, as well as the lift produced by the wings. Setting off from higher areas means it's more difficult for the planes to take off. In terms of money, this would mean building longer runways which would cost more, and no one wants that. This also means the planes require less fuel as they don't burn as much energy on takeoff. And there's less noise made as the planes don't have to work as hard. But despite this making the planes less noisy, airports are going to have pretty high noise levels. Imagine hearing planes zooming over your house while you're trying to get sleep at night. This is a key reason why airports are usually built on the coast far away from any residential areas as fish aren't generally known to file noise complaints. In some countries, airports actually have to provide upgrades for nearby houses that will be affected by the noise. Germany is one of these countries, and they do everything from improving roofs to adding wall insulation to cover all that noise. Building by the coast means that they don't have to pay up for all these expensive upgrades, which saves the airport lots of cash. Coastal areas also have weather advantages for flying, Sea breezes are steady winds that blow from the water to the land. Planes mostly land and take off with the wind, making it the perfect place to build an airport as there'll be no delays caused by unexpected strong winds. But while the sea breezes that come in spring and summer are great, areas near water can be prone to fog during fall and winter, so this part has its pros and cons. But not every airport is on the coast, as it does also pose a number of issues too. One of the biggest is birds. Our feathered friends love the coast because of all the yummy fish, but they can cause big problems for pilots. But airports manage to get around this using scare tactics. Birds don't really enjoy noise, and planes aren't the quietest of things. Airports also make loud bangs and even train hawks to take down birds that are in the way. The most obvious risk of building close to the sea, though, is flooding. Airports cost crazy amounts of money to build, and planes aren't cheap either. Back in 2018, Kansai Airport was flooded by Typhoon Jebi. They had to cancel all operations for two days, and the water was so high that it damaged the engines of the planes. While coastal airports put measures in place to protect against flooding, it's pretty difficult to save everything from a typhoon. With rising sea levels and an increase in extreme weather, these floodings are also looking more and more likely to happen. A quarter of the world's 100 busiest airports are less than 32 feet above sea level. And 12 of those, including New York, San Francisco, and Shanghai, are less than 16 feet. Yikes! All that water poses another problem. If planes overshoot the runway, they have nowhere to go. Overshooting is basically when the pilot underestimates the length of the runway and doesn't reach takeoff speed in time. There are usually extra bits of concrete or grass that the plane can run onto when the airports are on land. There'd be a bit of damage to the plane in this case, but nothing major. But with coastal airports, the plane might go straight into the water. Luckily, there's new tech that aims to prevent this from happening. These new kits let the pilots enter in all the flight calculations, including the weather conditions that could affect takeoff. This system then calculates how much runway the plane will need to stop. Many airports also have added soft concrete to the end of runways to avoid a watery disaster. When the plane glides onto this soft concrete, they get stuck and it stops them traveling too far. There are also financial issues with building airports next to the water. Land rent next to the coast or lakes is usually higher than the mainland due to the demand. 
Like 40% of the U.S. population lives on the coast, despite coastal areas only making up around 10% of America's total landmass. Airports require flat land to be built on, but this isn't always easy to find, and coastal land can pose particular problems due to sand conditions on marshland. But this doesn't mean it's not possible. One of the world's most famous airports, New York's JFK, was built on marshland. The land was a lot cheaper than usual, and marshland can't really be used for a lot. Of course, it can cost a lot of money to make the ground suitable to carry heavy loads, but this was all sorted. Finding such a big area close to one of the world's most famous cities was a very rare find, even if it was marshland. Now, imagine the scene. You arrive at the airport in Hawaii a bit earlier and decide to chill in the waiting area. Suddenly, you notice an anxious blonde lady in a white dress standing at a gate. She's looking out the window on the runway, waiting for someone's arrival. You reach into your bag for some chocolate to comfort her. But it's too late. She vanished into thin air. <gasps> Congratulations! You just met the lady-in-waiting, a resident phantom of the Honolulu International Airport. Like any phantom, she has a grim backstory. The lady once fell in love with a man, and he promised to marry her. But then, the happy groom flew abroad and never returned to his bride. His betrayal broke her heart, and she took her own life. But her phantom is still attached to the airport, and she waits for her man to return, just like the famous Japanese dog Hachiko waited for its master. Over the years, the local police have collected numerous complaints about the Lady Phantom wandering around the gates and other restricted areas of the airport. Ooh. Also, this entity likes to hang out in public bathrooms, just like Moaning Myrtle from the iconic fantasy novel. Some airport employees reported seeing paper dolls unfolding on their own while cleaning empty bathrooms in the middle of the night. In some cases, Toilet seats slam shut and toilets flush by themselves. However, it's unlikely to surprise anyone since many public bathrooms have automatic flushing. Unfortunately, this urban legend doesn't clarify the way to release the heartbroken phantom. But at least this story is a good reminder to think twice before you make any promises. And speaking of spooky ladies in white, the Kempe Goda International Airport in India also has one. A pilot once noticed a weird woman in a white sari on the runway. He called the airport workers asking to help her, but she disappeared by the time the staff arrived at the spot. Numerous witnesses have seen the same phantom in other parts of the airport. The lady haunted people in the cargo department. On escalators, and even in the parking lot. According to the media, nobody knows her background or the reason why she's here. Maybe her luggage was lost and she's just trying to get it back. Hmm. Today, Suwanaboom Airport in Bangkok is one of the busiest airports in the world. But it doesn't stop this transport hub from also holding the title of the most haunted place in Thailand. Although imagination tends to draw something old and dusty when we hear the word haunted, Suwanaboom is relatively new. It started operating in 2006, but it turned out that the land under the airport used to be an ancient burial site. Hmm. Work crews had to drain a marshland called Cobra Swamp to prepare the land plot for building. And mysterious events began to occur from the very first days of work. Wailing, creepy screams, and even classic music came out of nowhere. Some builders refused to continue construction because they were too scared of evil forces. The locals believed that they had angered the entities who were sleeping beneath the new airport. That's why 99 Thai monks were invited to perform a ritual. Together, they chanted for nine weeks to clear all the bad vibes. The ceremony was almost finished, but suddenly, a random man interrupted the monks and claimed to be possessed by one of the local entities. His message was pretty clear. You should build a proper spirit house to guarantee the smooth operation of the airport. Having said that, he fainted. Later, the guy woke up feeling normal and conscious. 
Well, the airport authorities decided to fulfill the mysterious request. Spirit houses are part of Thai traditional beliefs. Landowners build nice tiny shrines to establish friendships with invisible entities who might inhabit their plots of land. So, if you ever find yourself at the Bangkok airport, don't forget to check out this artifact, as well as the churning of the ocean, the remarkable sculptures that depict the ancient Hindu myth. The story is basically about light and dark deities working together to get Amrita, the beverage of immortality. Now, here's another reason why you should think twice before building a transport hub on questionable land. Welcome to Denver International Airport, reportedly one of the most famous haunted airports in the world. It stands on a special isolated plot of land that was considered sacred by its former residents, according to the media. People reported multiple problems and strange incidents going on at the airport from the very beginning of construction. Today, this place attracts numerous mystery hunters, and the number of urban legends around the airport multiplies. Some investigate the hidden meaning behind the local murals and gargoyles. Others believe that the giant cobalt-colored horse statue in front of the airport is haunted. That's because the sculpture, known as Blucifer, took the life of its creator, Luis Jimenez. In 2006, a piece came loose and hit the sculptor while he was finishing his work. The airport's enormous layout and remote location inspire some people to speculate that there's a secret bunker under it. In fact, it's bigger than some real cities like San Francisco, for example. But the spokesman of the airport debunked that myth saying that this transport hub must support at least 50 million travelers a year, and thus it needs to be huge. Our next destination may inspire you to revisit the Langoliers, created by the legendary horror writer Stephen King. Although the thriller took place at King's hometown airport in Bangor, Maine, we'll be talking about the historic Chandler Airport, located in Fresno, California. This place has many abnormal stories to tell, including reports of people going through the old terminal wall. Some passengers heard disembodied voices in the airport restaurant. The kitchen staff once reported hearing a suspicious noise while cleaning up. They went to see what was going on and witnessed a plate moving across the counter and then falling onto the floor. Perhaps the invisible customer was just upset by overly high food prices. Hey, it could happen. Just like Honolulu Airport, Chandler has a resident phantom. It's an old man in the control tower. Thankfully, this guy doesn't bother anybody. According to witnesses, he's just staring at the field as if he's watching invisible aircraft take off and land. Meanwhile, the urban legend behind Savannah Hilton Head International Airport is spooky and romantic at the same time. It says the following. If you land right after sundown, you'll get the chance to see two phantoms along the north side of the runway. Now, the legend says these are the phantoms of Richard and Catherine Dotson, who used to live on the land underneath the airport. They don't bother the passengers or staff either. It seems like they're just greeting arriving people. Now, our list can't be complete without the UK's Manchester Airport. This busy place serves around 28 million passengers a year, and also hosts a few spooky phantoms. Passengers and staff reported seeing creepy figures and weird phenomena, such as doors slamming on their own. The airport archives from the 1970s revealed that some staff refused to show up at Terminal 3 alone after dark because they were too scared. One night, the local worker saw a figure in a pilot's hat entering a toilet. No flights were scheduled to arrive or depart at that time, so he decided to follow the mysterious gentleman. But the bathroom was empty, and the motion-sensitive lights didn't show any reaction to the stranger. Some people reported meeting face-to-face -face with a phantom of a pilot in an old-school uniform. He usually wanders around Terminal 3 looking disoriented. But unfortunately, no one knows his backstory for sure. Another spooky resident of the airport is the Night Watchman, a phantom of a security guard from the 1960s. 
A former airport employee once met this gentleman and tried to talk to him, but the figure simply vanished into thin air, leaving the poor guy in shock. After that, he decided to leave his job for good. I can understand that. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh-so-delightful airplane meals must be cooked about 6 to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24-7. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there, and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it! So, if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. 
Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings, one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, but they have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds. And it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane, and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But. Would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m. on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Lilio Kalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii. On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway, all the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorns Timer, 44 years old, who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. 
At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on their routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, the plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect, which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. The first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward, and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. He prod the speed brakes into action, and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kaolui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. 
Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage, and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, half the roof falling off, it's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place. Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI powered in-flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you, have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh. Those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners. Meet SkyNest, a lie flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four hour time slot if you wanna take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie-flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind-boggling products. Check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites or Air France's La Première Cabin, which is believed to become one of the best first class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience, especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye-tracking equipment, 
the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi-transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. This way, takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Cutter Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q-Suites. It looks like this. On the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space, or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long-haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in-flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys's air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all-electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co-pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well, not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, these days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. 
There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel. And at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades. And the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier, which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. Okay, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked, but even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. The airplane cabin is pressurized, and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25%, and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true? Or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape. So partially, this fact is a myth. But it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll. It's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle, and planes fly over this area as usual. 
Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality, though, flying is a hands on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true, or is it too far fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And this is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost $18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds drop by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true. The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kind of numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers' and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight, duh.
It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings, except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made, but it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done 
that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only open the doors once a day before people enter the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit… uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. A mechanic from Illinois was called out to tow a crashed vehicle. As he approached the upside-down Ford Ranger, suddenly he was struck with inspiration. Now, most people would only see a wrecked car, but this guy saw a whole new type of vehicle. He then took two pickups, a Ford Ranger and a Ford F-150. Then, he spent six months working on a strange new vehicle. With the two cars combined, he created the illusion that there was only one. With enough room for passengers, it's even legally approved to drive along the road. With the four wheels on top all spinning autonomously in line with the ones on the road, he creates confusion wherever he drives. Yeah, it looks quite weird even when perfectly parked. The importance of eating your greens is something many wholesale companies try to convey to their potential buyers. 
one company in England called Birdseye went to the next level. And they built a car in the shape of a P to promote their product. Yeah. It's built on the chassis of an off-road go-kart, and it has many parts from a Volkswagen Beetle. It may look like a toy, but it's not. Equipped with a small Honda engine, this little zooming green P can even reach 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, you won't see it anywhere on the road, as its only purpose was for a commercial. But it did gain a lot of fame from ads. Rumor has it, many people even inquired about how they could purchase this weird vehicle. In 1964, a small, lightweight Jeep called the Mini Moke was designed in the US. They offered it to Great Britain with the belief that it would suit their terrain. Still, the car was rejected for its low ground clearance, and the open side doors weren't quite adapted for the English weather. It was further offered to warmer climates in Portugal and Australia. Ooh, yeah. The idea was that it could be used for tourism, and it could be an easy way to travel around. But without any other use for fun activities like four-wheel driving, it lost popularity. Still, with the introduction of electric engines, it's making a comeback. Well, it's no surprise, the clearance now is higher, the seats are more comfortable, oh, yeah. and the price is quite affordable too. The car costs about $21,000. In the early 20th century, cars began to rule the streets. Some of them were steam-powered, but that was far too noisy. There were even electric vehicles, but as they couldn't be powered outside of cities, they also failed to catch on. But there was another, stranger design. In the early 1920s, the Layout Helica was invented. It was also called the plane with no wings. In this car, the driver sits in the front, with one passenger seated behind. Yeah. The aerodynamic body of Layat Helica is structured similarly to a plane. It's mostly made from plywood, with a large propeller on the front to push the car forwards. The designer believed that all the added weight from normal car parts added unnecessary weight. At the time, steel was incredibly important for other uses, and the lightweight frame was his solution. Weighing about 550 pounds, this vehicle could reach speeds up to 106 miles per hour. That all sounds fantastic, but there was a serious downside. The car was incredibly noisy, and to protect their ears, people had to wear similar headwear as though they were in an actual plane. Not the best choice for a road trip, but surprisingly, 30 of these were sold. With a shortage of fuel in the 1940s, inventors were trying to find alternate forms of transport. The electric vehicles were looked at again after being left on the drawing board for the past 30 years. So, a brand new electric car, Lof Electric, was designed in 1938 and then built in 1942. It's a three-wheeled egg-shaped vehicle with room for only one passenger. This egg on wheels was powered by a battery pack. One full charge was enough for this little egg to travel up to 63 miles. It could ride along the roads at its top speed of 44 miles per hour. This tiny car was also quite lightweight, only about 770 pounds. I wish I had such a car today. It would squeeze into any parking spot. Yeah. Bonus, there were no blind spots in this car, with a 270-degree view around it. But, unfortunately, it didn't catch on, and only one was ever made. German engineering has always been at a high standard with automobiles, and one model, the Amphicar, took them to another level. A car that could also be driven into the water, and could function as a boat. While driving at modest speeds on the road, the wheels are slightly lower than normal, but once in the water, the front wheels work as rudders. It could sail at a speed of up to seven knots. The designers were aware that it wasn't the best boat or car, so they advertised it as the best boat driven on the road and the best car to sail on water. It was actually pretty decent as a seaworthy vessel. Many people were surprised that there were no leaks, even if left docked for several hours. It grew in popularity, and almost 4,000 vehicles were sold in the 1960s. It even inspired several more models of boat cars in the automobile industry. Have you ever wanted to hire a limousine? What if the limo is crossed with a plane? 
one guy decided he wanted to combine his love for a 727 plane with the ability to drive it on the road. First, he found a plane. Then he removed the wings and the tail from the body and attached the plane's body to a Mercedes-Benz bus. So, it's kinda a regular bus in a plane's disguise. Stretched at 52 feet, it became the biggest limousine in the world. There's enough room for 40 people, but it can still drive at up to 124 miles per hour. The cockpit is mostly preserved. However, a steering wheel was replaced to drive the limo, for obvious reasons. The original folding staircase still works, making it a nice welcome to passengers while boarding the Boeing limo. Ooh. Surprisingly, it's registered to be driven on the road, and you can even rent this 24,000-pound limousine. At the beginning of the 20th century, car engines became a lot more efficient, and the availability of affordable gas helped automobiles really kick off. Back in 1927, car designers invented something really posh, Meet Bugatti Royale. It was the most luxurious car ever made. At 21 feet long and weighing 7,000 pounds, almost twice the average weight of a sedan built today. However, at the time of its creation, there was a great decline in the economies around the world. Unfortunately, this lavish car wasn't a success. Even the royalty of Europe had no interest in such an extravagant purchase. 25 had been planned to be made, but as interest faded, only three were sold. The production line ceased with only seven built in the end. The engine design was based on a French aircraft engine and is the largest ever built. But following the failure of the Bugatti Royale, the remaining engines were reused for newly built high-speed rail cars for the French railway system. In 1930, an inventor, John Archibald Purvis, created something he believed will be the high-speed vehicle of the future. He got his inspiration from designs made by Leonardo da Vinci. John felt that the brilliant man was onto something. He then created the Dynosphere, a mono-wheeled vehicle that ran on electricity. This 10 feet high singular wheel made from lattice iron and covered in leather weighed around 1,000 pounds. The driver's seat and the motor are connected and mounted on wheels. At first, steering was only possible when the driver leaned to either side, but later, a steering wheel was implemented to make it easier. It could reach up to 30 miles per hour. There was some interest in it as a fun activity for the beach. Ah, and a modified version with eight seats was also made. But unfortunately, the designer's vision of giant wheels covering the highways instead of cars didn't come true. Probably because he has yet to find a way to stop it from moving, other than running into something. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough filled with snow and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. 
First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area it's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. Seven to eight million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. 
that's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the US president, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan, either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other. So the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. Welcome to Ever City. It's a megapolis built inside a relatively young mountain. Everest is only about 55 million years old but it's already the highest mountain in the world, 29,000 feet. Picture the Statue of Liberty. Now, uh -oh. imagine she had 83 twin brothers and sisters, and they were all standing on top of each other. If you wanted to get there back in the day, you had to pass some serious fitness tests, train for months, have perfect health, and spend a lot of money. Oh, and be a little crazy. Now that Mount Everest has been turned into a city though, you don't need any of that stuff. Well, except money. Apartments here don't come cheap. It's easy to navigate around Ever City. The whole thing's basically six circles. It looks like a finger with six rings on it. The lowest and largest circle is the residential area. The highest and smallest ones near the top is where the richest people live. Below that is the meditation circle. Then a circle for hotels and two circles of pure entertainment. Ever City isn't built like an ordinary city. You won't find tall houses or six-lane highways here. Almost all buildings are built inside the mountain. At first, people were building ordinary houses, but strong icy winds and avalanches kept knocking them down. Then, engineers decided to build houses inside the mountain. They're connected by underground tunnels. From the inside, the mountain looks like a system of labyrinths. The entrance to Ever City is located at the foot of the mountain. Every day, hundreds of thousands of cars enter and leave the city. There's no factories or power stations inside. Electricity, gas, food, everything comes from the outside world. That's why all the stuff in Ever City's so insanely expensive. People want to keep the mountain covered in snow. That's another reason why there's no factories and stuff. There's almost no heating in the houses. People live here like they do in those ice hotels. But you don't need to go around wearing a bunch of layers. Designers created special thermal pants, socks, and t-shirts that go under your regular clothes. All that, plus jeans and a t-shirt, is totally enough to keep you toasty warm. To keep your face fresh, they've come up with a special cream. It warms and moisturizes your skin, and it's SPF 100, which is about what you'd need if you liked walking around on the top of Everest. Want to stop by a coffee shop, then grab a double bacon cheeseburger and maybe a slice of cheesecake? And that'll set you back about $500. A movie ticket costs at least $100. And internet's so expensive, you'd have to pay about a dollar just to watch this video. Even so, more and more people are moving to Ever City every year. It's peaceful and quiet. You feel harmony and unity with nature. There's also a world-famous meditation center on its own special circle. People from all over the world come here to get their body and mind back into harmony.
But the greatest draw is that you can visit the summit whenever you want, like it's your daily walk in the park. Before Ever City, conquering this mountain was extremely dangerous. There's three times less oxygen up there than in almost any other city. If your body doesn't get enough oxygen, you can find yourself in big problems. Climbers used to take oxygen tanks with them, which slowed them down and made everything more complicated. It's hard to get out of the way of an avalanche with huge metal cylinders on your back. Strong winds are a big problem too. At the top, the wind can blow at 100 miles an hour. Try to nail one of those jumping selfies and you'll be blown clean off the mountain. It's so cold that icicles form on your hair and your skin gets covered with a thin crust of ice. And when you're up there, you have a special terrible superpower. A loud scream could cause an avalanche. But now, everything's chill. To get to the top of Everest, you just need to sit in a comfortable snowmobile capsule. It'll protect you from any bad weather or the odd avalanche. If you get covered with too much snow, you just turn on a powerful heater, wait a few for the snow to melt, and continue on your journey. Oxygen cylinders inside the cabin let you breathe normally. The new road to the top is well lit, and there are signs everywhere, so you never get lost. The only problem is traffic. Every day, thousands of people want to visit the highest point on the planet. You might have to wait in line for several hours. But don't worry, all Ever City capsules are equipped with high-speed internet, an 8K screen, and game consoles. And if you get hungry, you can always order food, delivered by the latest AI robot snowmobile. You made it! So quickly find a parking spot, leave your capsule there, and head to the ski lift that'll take you straight to the top. Now all you have to do is put on an oxygen mask and enjoy the view. While you're up there, you notice an ad inviting you to dine at the highest restaurant in the world, just 100 feet below the summit. It'll set you back around $10,000. Tempting, but you're not hungry. Feel like the king of the world. Dine with us at best food ever rest. Well, pretty good ads, but you already feel like the king of the world. You scream with delight and, well, unfortunately, you just can't stay up there forever. There's not that much space at the top, so they only give you about a minute to enjoy the view. But it's okay, you can come back tomorrow. There are two ways back down the mountain. You can get in your capsule and drive home, or grab a snowboard and ride down. But before you rent some skis or snowboard, you need to show your Everest driver's license. It says if you've passed the special snowboard and skiing test. You take a snowboard and jet down a lit track. You zoom past the top of some houses sticking out just below the summit. That's where the wealthiest people live. They can just walk out their front doors and take a special elevator up to the top. You'd need to be a billionaire to have one of those houses, but there are over 2,000 of them right now, about half of them from the USA and China. Unfortunately, you live much lower down the mountain, but that has its advantages. The lower you live, the less you pay for food, entertainment, and electricity. You glide into the meditation center for a bit. A special ventilation system delivers air directly from the top of the mountain, plus a little added oxygen. You breathe in pure harmony. All six rings of Ever City have 360 degree views. And from way up there, all you can see is peaceful snowy mountains mixing with wispy clouds. After meditation, you head down to the entertainment rings. They've got it all. Coffee shops, any meal you can think of, shows, bowling, arcades, even an ice skating rink that's half inside, half outside the mountain. There are different gyms, but they all have one thing in common, sun baths. You lie down in a hammock or bed and curtains slide apart above your head. The sun shines through the sealed windows and you get a full dose of the purest sunlight on earth. Just five minutes and you're ready for the rest of your day. If you don't want to go outside anymore, you can get home through the tunnels. They're not dark and cold, if that's what you're thinking. Evercity tunnels look like ice caves lit up by hundreds of lights. It feels like a snowy fairy tale. After a short walk, you get to your apartment. It's compact, but cozy. To save money on electricity, you chose to go without a fridge. No problem, you keep your food in a little box just outside your window. The snow will keep it cold. With the help of a heating and filtration system, you get all the water you need 
from the millions of tons of snow on Everest. It's the cleanest water around. In the evening, you go down and watch a movie. There's an outdoor cinema at the foot of the mountain. At night, a huge machine projects movies directly onto the snowy surface of Everest. You watch the movie in capsules, either alone or in groups, kind of like a drive-in. Come on over! Visit Ever City any time of the year. The near future. Our planet is running out of energy sources, and the human population is growing. There's less free space on Earth every year. People have to move to other planets as soon as possible. But there isn't enough energy for spaceships and interstellar voyages. You're a member of a group of scientists searching for energy sources in the universe. Solar power, windmills, hydro and thermal power plants. It's not enough. You offer an adventurous but risky idea. You want to create an object and accelerate it to the speed of light. This object will start generating infinite energy. Other scientists immediately reject this idea. Such an experiment can destroy the entire planet and even the solar system. If something moves faster than light particles, it creates a black hole. To reduce the risks, you suggest speeding up a small and thin object, like a simple needle. As soon as it reaches the speed of light and releases energy, special machines similar to solar panels will absorb this energy. Only one millisecond of moving at the speed of light will be enough for humanity. Then the needle should be stopped. You suggest to slow it down with the help of Mount Everest. You want the needle to smash into it. As soon as you start working on the experiment, you face an unsolvable problem. An ordinary needle, like any other object with mass, can't reach the speed of light. According to the laws of physics, it's impossible. To do this, you need to turn the needle into a beam of photons. The metal of the needle will be erased into dust during acceleration to the speed of light. Earth's atmosphere shows strong resistance to a moving object. So now, you need to create the strongest durable material in the universe. It not only has to withstand the air resistance, but also not be torn apart by the energy growing in it. When any object increases its speed, its energy increases too. You need a lot of money to create such a needle. But before you get it, you have to conduct this experiment in a simulation program to prove you're doing the right thing. This program is a computer hologram of the solar system. The program imitates and visualizes all the laws of physics. You can run your experiment using this model, and if it goes well, you'll get money to implement your plan. So, you create a computer simulation of the needle. Then, you build a machine with an incredibly powerful engine. It works like a rocket. Several motors are attached to the needle. They help reach the speed of sound, then charge the needle with energy and release it. Using the charge force, the needle should accelerate to the speed of light and crash into Everest. You'd need to set the launch spot of the needle a long way from the mountain for the whole operation to work out. Air resistance greatly hinders the acceleration. The needle's path must pass through thousands of miles of free space. You decide that it's better to launch the experiment from space, where there's no resistance. To do this, you build a base on the moon in the simulation. Computers calculate the exact start time and needle position. You need to know the speed of the Earth's movement around its axis and the Moon's movement around our planet. The slightest deviation from the course can cause the needle to crash into the ocean or a city. If it gets into the water, severe floods and tsunamis will happen all around the world. The computer calculates the ideal moment for the needle to fly. You're ready to start the operation. Scientists and presidents of different countries are watching the simulation. You're so nervous, you're sweating. You come up to the computer and press the start button. Everyone is looking at the big screen. A rocket with a needle placed on top flies up. It's rising high above the moon. It reaches the speed of sound. The first engine falls off. The rocket's mass decreases and its speed increases. Half the distance between our planet and the moon is gone. There's two engine turbines left. The speed of sound is exceeded by 10 times. The second engine falls off. The needle is approaching the Earth's atmosphere. The third engine generates a huge charge of energy, strikes it into the needle, and flies away. The needle turns bright red and hot like the sun. It penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. The protective layers of our planet can't prevent the needle from reaching its goal. The sky lights up with a bright flash. In the next half second, the needle will hit Everest at the speed of light. Two seconds later, your experiment will fail. 
And here's why. The greater the speed of any object, the larger the mass and the amount of energy that accumulates inside. When the needle reaches the speed of light, its energy begins to increase indefinitely. The mass grows to infinity. And when this happens, a black hole is formed, a massive object with an incredible gravitational force that absorbs absolutely everything, even light particles, photons, and the time dimension. This is called the event horizon. Literally, everything that is an event, time, space, matter, is absorbed by the black hole. No one knows what is inside the black hole. After one millisecond, the needle almost reaches the speed of light. It releases a huge amount of energy into the atmosphere. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see how the air is ionized. That is, the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The needle cuts through the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is lit up with a bright light. All the clouds and every water molecule around the needle instantly evaporate at the high temperature. The sky becomes crystal clear hundreds of miles around the spot. In the center of this clean circle is the needle, and it's approaching Mount Everest. Hundreds of thousands of tons of snow burn up as soon as the needle gets close to it. It has reached the speed of light. A thick layer of ground melts and flies away in different directions. It looks like someone has thrown a spear into an ice cream mountain. Everest can't handle so much energy and is torn apart into a million pieces like a sandcastle. The incredible power of the blast wave destroys everything around. Stone, wood, soil, leaves, concrete, everything falls apart into billions of pieces because of the powerful energy and heat. Then, all these molecules are erased. The needle moves faster than photons, and as soon as it overtakes the light, it starts to overtake time. From the needle's point of view, all events begin to go in reverse. The mass of the needle becomes infinite, and the greater the mass, the greater the energy. A burst of unthinkable gravitational force absorbs all space. Land, trees, nearby cities, the Earth's crust, and the core, everything disappears in a matter of seconds. A black hole absorbs light and time. An absolute black void has come. The black hole is growing. Holographic International Space Station is shrinking thanks to the strong pressure of gravity and is being pulled into a black void. Then, it's the moon's turn. The force of gravity increases quickly. The hole is getting heavier and more massive. All the planets of the solar system collapse as the gravitational black giant grows. The sunlight goes in and never comes back. The black hole becomes thousands of times heavier than the sun. Our star splits into millions of thin strips of light, like spaghetti, and spits out powerful streams of energy. An empty sector of outer space with an expanding black hole is in the place where our solar system was just moments ago. Meteorites flying past it also fall into the trap. Just one small needle managed to cause such a disaster. The simulation ends. The program breaks down because it can't calculate further events. You realize it was a bad idea after all. You